Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay. Um, so I'm the director of the e-research lab within the School of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering at the University of Queensland. And we've been working on this project because it's become very obvious to us that citizen science is expanding at a rapid rate. If you look at the definition of citizen science, I thought I'd better include this for people who aren't aware of what it is, although I imagine most people in the room are. It's a program of scientific work in which volunteers, many of whom have no specific scientific training, perform research-related tasks, such as observations, measurements, computations. Now, that's the definition on Wikipedia. I think it's expanded since that definition was entered because I think there are other examples which I'm going to show you which involve things like corrections, OCR corrections, which you know, doesn't include observations, measurements, or computation. But most citizen science applications are in the environmental monitoring area, in particular ornithology. The other big area is astronomy. And the very rapidly expanding area is phonology. So using citizen science to citizen scientists to monitor flora and fauna to see how their behaviour and their migration changes over seasonal and climate variations. Citizen scientists are also monitoring water and air quality and ecosystems, such as reef ecosystems. And the case study I'll describe today is a reef ecosystem. Now, why is it becoming so important? Why is it expanding at such a rapid rate? It's both because of the technology and the availability of new technologies. So the availability of the internet, social networking tools and social networking software. It's also because of the issues that are becoming critical climate change. Everyone's aware of that. People want to do something about it. They want to contribute what they can to an understanding of climate change, particularly in their local area. The other reason why it's becoming so important is because scientists themselves are becoming aware that the only way that they can often um, generate the longitudinal data, both temporally and spatially, is by um, harnessing the effort of the masses or the crowds. The other reasons are the increasing availability of technologies to streamline data capture. So things like smartphones, iPads, Twitter enable almost near real-time data capture. And increasingly, citizen science programs aren't just enabling the general public to capture data in a sort of unfocused way. Increasingly, scientists are actually trying to target and focus the citizen science efforts at much narrower, more specific scientific studies. And I think that's an interesting trend that's happening in citizen science. So some general examples. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology, in particular, has done a huge amount with the eBird project, Feeder Watch, Nest Watch. And all of those projects are contributing towards the um, global avian knowledge network. There's the Internet Bird Collection, which is mainly audio, video, and photographic collections of birds. Nature Mapping Foundation, which is monitoring biodiversity. Plant Watch and Project Bud Burst, which are phenology projects. Citizen Weather Observer Program. Common, um, commonality across all of these is they're really about phenology or about environmental monitoring. But there are others, Folded, that you're probably all aware of. It's part of the Games with a Purpose paradigm. And it's an online game that um, enables collaborators, online community members to um, participate in protein folding games. And then there's Galaxy Zoo that most of you are aware of, where the general public can help to classify the millions of galaxies that are out there. And then here's a, one that's slightly different flavour, and it's the National Library of Australia. And they're enlisting community members to correct the OCR of digitised newspapers. 
So in Australia, well, apart from the National Library one, we've got many environmental projects. Water Watch is one where community members can monitor the water quality of their local creek or river or um, beach or estuary. And then the one that I'm going to be talking about today, which is based at the University of Queensland, is the Coral Watch Project, and I'll describe that in more detail. So, it occurred to us that citizen science is not going to go away. It's only going to expand. And that there must be a need for common tools across all of these citizen science programs. How can we identify what are the common needs? What can we develop that can be reused across some of these projects? First thing is, many scientists don't trust the data. So I won't name who, who it was, but one of them in particular said, the wisdom of the masses is an oxymoron. Okay, so that's the attitude of many scientists. So in particular, they need tools to improve the data quality. They want to improve the accuracy, the completeness, the consistency, the timeliness and the relevance of the data. They want to minimise error and bias. So they not only need tools to improve the data quality, but then they need tools to measure the data reliability so they can decide how, um, whether they should base their decisions on this data or whether it should be ranked lower and it should you know, be taken, the reliability should be taken into consideration. They need tools to detect outliers and inconsistencies. In particular, they need to be able to correlate sources of data which overlap but come from you know, different sources. They need online taxonomies and tools for species identification. So they want to help the general public identify species and they want them to label those species using taxonomies. Online training is required to help the volunteers understand the precise protocols and methods so that their measurements are accurate. And then web interfaces are needed that engage with communities, attract and retain good volunteers. Now the number of volunteers is very important because the, the scientists themselves want large sample sizes and they want duplication of data because that helps to validate the quality and to reduce sampling error. We need web interfaces that provide rewards and recognition and we also need interfaces that provide volunteers with feedback to the data that they enter. So the two objectives of what we're looking at is number one, how do you improve the quality of citizen science data, and number two, how do you measure the trust and reliability and then use that to filter out unreliable data when scientists are doing searching and browsing or reusing the data. And this just describes some of the um, you know, subcomponents of both of those objectives there, but I'll go into that in more detail. Okay, then the second aim is to develop these tools in a framework a technological framework that can be reused across different citizen science projects. So we want to be able to have citizen science databases sitting underneath and on top of that we're going to develop collaborative tagging tools, tagging of both the users and the data sets, visualisation tools, social network tools, trust metric tools, things like Twitter but specifically for citizen science projects and then the mobile interfaces, smartphone technologies so users in the field can upload the data as quickly as possible. Oh and then the main one at the top, the validation and consistency checking methods. So the case study that we used was Coral Watch. And it's based at the University of Queensland and its aim is to the improve, improve the extent of information on coral bleaching events and coral bleaching trends. And there's 1,300 volunteers from over 80 countries and that's the website if you want to look at it. Now, like most citizen science projects, what they've done is adapted their coral bleaching measurement techniques so that it's a very simple protocol and very simple procedure so that anyone can do it and they have these coral health charts and so volunteers that consist of tourists, dive groups, students, scientists themselves use these coral charts and they map the coral colour chart along particular transects at particular reefs around along the east coast of Queensland. Now the Coral Watch website I'll describe what it used to be like and then describe what we've implemented for them. 
So they have a data sheet, which you can download from their website, print it off, complete, and then mail it back to them and someone enters the data and uploads it. So there's a downloadable printed form. Um, and an online data entry form, but was only available to the coordinators of the program. So the data that's actually captured is the contributor captures their name, contact details, and something about their background. But each survey, they capture a reef name, hopefully the latitude and longitude, date and time, the method that they were using when they did the survey. Were they snorkeling? Were they diving? Were they walking on the reef? The water temperature, the weather conditions at the time, the coral species, so they have to be able to identify the species they're looking at, and then they follow a transect, and along that transect they collect the colour data by comparing the chart with the coral transect they're going along. Now what the Coral Watch organisers asked us to do is to develop Coral Watch version 2.0. So we had to take this legacy database, which was an access database, which was generated by manual input from forms that were um, posted to them from the volunteers. So we had to go about kind of redeveloping the whole Coral Watch website. And we, in the process, they wanted us to improve the data quality and develop some trust metrics and give some measure of the reliability of the data. So we had to design a new data, metadata schema and new database tables. Um, you could use SQL Server, we use PostgreSQL. Um, we developed user registration. The previous Coral Watch website didn't allow user registration. Only the administrators and coordinators could log in and upload data or edit the data and manage the data. So we had volunteers now register and are authorised and authenticated, and they enter their profiles as well. We also had to support batch upload by registered users, so they can generate Excel spreadsheets and upload that in one go. Now the major component of the first phase was migrating the legacy data and in the process analysing the errors and developing scripts to correct the errors and to complete missing data. So I'm going to describe the data validation and verification services we developed. We also had to develop um, ranking tools so users can rank each other and we use a one to five star ranking and they also had the ability to rank surveys so you can rank other users and you can rank the data. And then we've developed trust computation services, and I'll describe those. And finally, the web-based search, browse, analysis, and visualization interfaces that take into account the trust ranking of the data. So this shows the overall architect architecture. Um, let's see. So we have, is this working? Oh, no, I pushed the wrong button. I don't know if this one is working. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. So we'll go back. So we have the Coral Watch database, which is PostgreSQL, and we use PostGIS for the indexing. And then the trust metrics are um, recorded in there as well. And then we have R statistical processing so that the scientists themselves to, can generate graphs and reports from the data. Um, the Coral Watch server. Um, has a jQuery search interface over the top of it, and we use open layers, so you can plug in Google Earth, Bing Maps, or Yahoo Maps. Um, the ranking and filtering occurs up here when a user enters a search. Um, what else? We're going to require ontologies to integrate the Coral Watch data with these other related data sets from IMOS, the Integrated Marine Observing System, Reef check and AIMS data. In addition, I haven't got it there, but we have motor satellite data which provides ground truth as well. So it provides water temperature and coral bleaching data that we can compare with the citizen science data. So we're going to be using ontologies to map this data into our common model over here. Okay, so when we did the mapping of the legacy data across to the new database, we did an analysis of the data itself. And what we found was that the number one problem was that the GPS data was missing, okay? 60% of the records had GPS data missing, but it did have the name of the reef. So we were able to go and use services such as BioGeomancer to enter the reef name and get back the Latin long. So that was one of the major problems. 
Um, then we had a problem with incorrect data, and this is very common with citizen science data and particularly environmental monitoring data. The most common problems was that, you know, for example, water temperature was missing. That's the number one problem. We had zero in there. Um, but the other problems were the temperature would be entered in the wrong unit, Fahrenheit as opposed to centigrade. The latitude and longitude would be transposed. A latitude or longitude value is negated. And you see this because when you display the data through a mapping interface, you'll get all these points which are upside down, so they'll be off the south coast of Western Australia instead of off the you know, northern coast of Eastern Australia, okay? And so it's pretty obvious what's going on. Um, coordinates missing or coordinates outside the country range. So these are very typical errors. And then we get more complex invalid data, and you can have rules there to check for this kind of thing. So here, the time entered is zero, which is midnight, and it's got full sunshine and no Latin long. So, you know, obviously there's, you know, discrepancies here in the data. Um, we had invalid data in usernames and in colored chart data. Now, a lot of the invalid data can be fixed by a combination of rules and by validation based on XML schemas and controls over, um, you know, fields, the range of values permitted in fields and the format of the values. So a lot of these can be fixed. So then we started developing the metadata and data validation services, which included the registration, authentication, and authorization of users. I don't know where this is going. It's going somewhere. I don't think we've got any worries about me blinding anyone in the room. <laughs> oh, is, it, is that what it is? I've got my finger over. <laughs> it's just like using a camera, isn't it? <laughs> Um, so there's the authentication, the registration, authentication, authorization of users. That's fundamental to citizen science. If it's anonymous, you're going to get all sorts of rubbish. So, but if you can trace them, then you know, they, they're less likely to put rubbish in there. You have to have user-friendly interfaces with strict validation rules. So you can handle the errors at submission time rather than post-processing. So we use an XML schema. We use control vocabularies with pull-down menus. We have control vocabularies for people names, gazetteers of place names, species taxonomies, value ranges and formats. We use tools, existing services like BioGeomancer, where you enter the reef name, it gives you the latitude and longitude. Um, other areas that we're working on, which we haven't got to yet, are the use of smartphones and digital cameras with built-in GPS. So the GPS is captured automatically. Um, and then using ontologies and trend analysis of previous data so you can do comparisons of the citizen science data with other sources to look for consistency. So we can compare our citizen science data with the AIMS water temperature data, satellite derived data from satellite images or sensor data. Okay, so this is what the new user interface looks like. This is entering a new survey name you know, what your affiliation is, your country, the reef name, it brings up these values automatically if you haven't got GPS. It'll give you the observation date. And again, these are all pull down menus. The conditions, light conditions, water temperature, and the activity you are undertaking. And then you can enter the actual survey itself where you enter the value from the color chart and the coral types over a particular transect. And it'll give you then the color distribution and the shape distribution. How am I going for time? Okay. So, the data cleaning itself corrected about 80% of syntactic errors and corrected most of the missing data. We also, through the data cleaning, we were able to collect data on the number of errors per contributor, which is very useful. But the thing that we couldn't do is the semantic validation. So we can't tell. We can tell if the data is formatted correctly and the values fall in the right range, but because we haven't really, it's difficult to compare with existing sources. There are other sources out there, but it's rather difficult to do that. We'd have to do processing of satellite images to look for coral bleaching events. AIMS, the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences, does have coral bleaching events. So there is some ground truth data out there. But what we thought was that instead of trying to validate the data semantically by doing complex correlation across these heterogeneous data sets, where the other data sets aren't 100% reliable anyway, why don't we look, can we use social trust metrics, 
such as is used in um, online commerce, e-commerce systems, um, such as eBay, Amazon, that kind of thing. Can we use social trust to measure data reliability? Can we infer the trust across large social networks and use that to filter out bad data? And there are different trust models and we're at the moment evaluating these different trust models. Okay, so trust, commitment to an action based on a belief that the future actions of that person will lead to a good outcome. So Jennifer Goldbeck does fantastic work in trust metrics. And as I said, it's used in things like eBay and Amazon.com. So it's subjective. So the web-based social trust metric must be focused and must be very simple. And it has to fall within a range. It's not binary. I trust them or I don't. You have metrics. So we're using a one, zero to five stars. So the challenges are how do you generate trust values for all the people in a network when you only know a few of them around you? Okay, so this is where the inferencing comes in. Can you infer data is reliable? Can you infer if you trust the person, you can trust their data? So that's one of the assumptions we're making. But with things like Jennifer Goldbeck's film trust, she has a algorithm for actually combining the trusting the person and trusting the sets, data sets that they recommend. So we have to identify what are the best algorithms for measuring trust of a person and trust of the data from multiple metrics. But also one of the problems is how to measure changing trust values over time. So suppose I'm a contributor and um, at the time when I started doing this, I was a you know, professor at UQ and then I retire and I start, to, uh, this is rather an elder, ageist um, analogy, but I get elderly and my eyesight's not so good. And <laughs> And I start to, you know, become a little bit um, not so reliable with my data. And so people's quality of data and their ranking will vary over time. So that's an example of someone like myself. But then young people, it's shown that the number of years that they've been contributing, the quality of the data actually improves over time. And there's, um, other research has shown that it improves up to about 5% um, in quality in accuracy every year that they're contributing data. So, trust metrics, recommender systems. They, um, the aim is to find the reliable and trusted data, generate a predictive trust rating between users, and you can calculate the rating between individuals who don't know each other if there's a path between them that you can find. And that's one of the problems. There may not be a path between two particular um, individuals. And you can calculate rankings between individuals, between individuals and data sets as well. So for example, Jane ranks Peter with five stars, Peter ranks Abdul with three stars. So can you infer Jane ranks Abdul with three stars when I don't know Abdul? So that's the kind of thing we're trying to do. Okay, but there are other factors that are important. And so rather than just using social trust metrics to calculate the trust ranking, age is important. So research by, um, I can't remember what the citation is, if you read the paper, it's in there. But research by other groups has shown that as the age of the contributors, particularly with school children, increases, then the quality of the data improves. The quality of the data improves with the experience of the contributors. So the first year is the worst, but it improves about 5% per annum. The duration of contributions improves. So the longer they've been contributing, the better it is. The number of contributions and frequency of contributions is important. The amount of training, and whether it's online training or personal face-to-face -face training is important. Their role, are they a scientist, government employee, student, teacher, volunteer, tourist? and the quality of their past data, or the number of errors. And we've got some of that information by mapping the Coral Watch across from the original database. And so then we use all of these different attributes of the person to generate an accumulative trust value by weighting these. And what we're working on at the moment is trying to optimise these weightings so we can come up with an accumulative trust value of zero to five stars. Okay. And depending on who you are, if I'm doing a search for data and I've ranked my particular group of people I know, I will get different accumulated trusts for the community than someone else. 
Yeah. And so it's a personalized ranking and a personalized filtering as well. And so we've developed this tool that allows you to rank particular individuals and then to calculate the community ranking. So I've ranked Bacar um, with four stars, but the aggregate community ranking is 2.5 stars. Now, individuals can see the rankings they give others and they can see their own aggregated community ranking, but they can't see how other individuals rank them because that would cause all sorts of problems. <laughs> and we're trying to attract volunteers, not repel them. Okay, and so then we've been developing social trust graphs as well. So um, here we've got Bakar in the centre and the two people who he knows and then who they know and, you know, we can show these kinds of trust rankings and tr across the graph. And then based on the work that we've done so far, once we've calculated these accumulated trust values, then, for example, I can say, OK, show me all the coral watch observations for masthead reef between 2007 and 2009 with a ranking of two or more stars. I'm not interested in it if it's only got one star or zero stars. And then we've been then display it. You can display it on both the timeline between 2007 and 2009 on a mapping interface and its color coded according to the ranking of the surveys. Here, here well, this one is probably, it actually doesn't correspond to that, but here you can see purple is five stars, blue is four, green is three, two is yellow, and one is red. Okay, so where are we? I'm almost finished. Um, so we're at the stage of doing evaluation. So the assessment criteria. So we want to be able to assess what are the actual improvements in data quality that this filtering um, will provide. So we are working on optimising the weightings and the algorithms for calculating the aggregate trust metric. Um, now, in order to assess what we're doing, we need to understand what's the precision before and after. So we need to have some kind of benchmark or ground truth data, and this is where it gets difficult. So we have to have a look at, we've got some data from AIMS, the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences, that has got um, a database of coral bleaching events. We also have sea surface or water temperature data from AIMS, um, which has been derived from satellite imagery. So we can use that ground truth data, and we want to be able to overlay the citizen science data with this ground truth data to evaluate the performance of the tools. But we also need to evaluate them with regards to scalability, their ability to be adapted to other disciplines, other citizen science projects. And then we need to do usability tests and conduct surveys and interviews with stakeholders and users. Future work. We need to be able to adapt the trust metrics over time because people's ability to carry out these citizen science observations and measurements may change, either improve or um, worsen over time. We're developing annotation tools for the actual observations themselves because you want to be able to provide feedback to the contributors and tag outlying data to say that this needs to be checked. We need to develop mechanisms for identifying malicious attacks and to remove malicious contributors. As I mentioned before, we need to be able to correlate the citizen science data with AIMS data and derived data from motor satellite images. Um, statistical analysis tools are useful for identifying gaps in the data and then for targeting volunteers at those particular areas where there are gaps. We want to evaluate the tools in the context of other kinds of citizen science projects. And mobile applications is another big area. So handheld field data capture devices using smartphones and iPads for uploading photos and data, for also providing online species identification keys. So to help users actually identify the species, the location, the date and time, and other um, contextual information. And then finally, things like subscriber notifications via iPhone. So if someone's in a particular area, they get notified automatically that these endangered species or threatened species are believed to live in this area. If you see any, please take a photo, upload the location and any other data. So finally, I think 
most people will agree that the citizen science movement is rapidly expanding across many different disciplines. But despite the cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary nature of these projects, there are a lot of commonalities and common challenges. In particular, there's a critical need for automatic techniques to improve the quality and trust of citizen science data. I think the optimum approach is to combine data quality improvement with social trust metrics to actually improve the reliability and provide a measure of the reliability of the data. And then finally, the analysis and visualization tools will help scientists understand how they can reuse that data, whether it should be reused, is it reliable enough? And I just want to acknowledge Abdul Alabri, who's the PhD student who's been working on this, Diana Klein and the Coral Watch people, Catherine Van Ingen, who's our Microsoft contact, and Microsoft Research for their support. Um, and there's contact details. So I don't know if we have time for any questions. Thank you very much. Are there, are there questions? I didn't understand at all how to use uh, social trust uh, as a metric. Um, because you are either getting some data from people, they make yeah. their own measurements, give you data, or you present them something on a website and ask for their input. In either case, uh, the only validation is by either having ground truth or an expert check it or follow up resulting in some quantitative assessment. Seems to me that the opinions of their peers are completely irrelevant. How can you possibly use social trust for a scientific input, not rating of movies? Okay. Um, in the case of Coral Watch, we have a large community of coral reef scientists who are involved. And they're doing the ranking of the individuals and the ranking of the data sets. So it's, it's less likely to be, you're not going to have school children ranking other school children. Okay, you're now going I understand. To have, that wasn't clear. So yeah, you, you you're going to have experts the, evaluate, not yeah, experts. Primarily the project coordinators who are involved will be, and the scientists who are involved, are ranking particular individuals and data sets. Yeah. Time for one more question. So it's really the consumers of the citizen science data. Thanks, Jane, for both a very interesting report and a, a nice larger framing of the set of issues. Um, and mine is more on the latter, is about scaling this or interoperability with other kinds of citizen science. So some of the things you talked about, say Galaxy Zoo, which you used as an example, is done mm -hmm. of both using training data to start to calibrate and then doing comparison uh, between different people to, to validate the data. Yeah. Can you bring those, are, to what extent have, can you bring those things in to generalize the tools and to what extent can you take your coral reef tools and generalize them to other kinds of citizen science projects. Right. Okay. Um, so the first question was about using training data for calibration. Right. Okay. Um, in this situation, that's not relevant, I don't think. I know it's being used a lot in machine learning applications um, for things like um, building large training sets for machine learning. Yeah. Um, and then regard, with regard to taking what we've done and applying it to other citizen science projects, the, one of the next steps is to actually, we're looking for other citizen science projects to work with to see how we can apply them in those areas. Um, we'd like to do it in another environmental area initially. I think that won't be so difficult. But moving some of our tools outside of environmental monitoring will be more difficult. So, for example, moving it to the OCR may not be so relevant. But I think if you can have some kind of ranking of contributors and ranking of the results that they've generated, that can be applied across citizen science projects. And it's the models and the algorithms that you use to do that, they may need to be tailored for different 
disciplines. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Jane. Appreciate okay. it. Fantastic talk. Thank you again. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce um, Cecilia Aragon from right here, in our, in, we're in your neighborhood, so, yes. <laughs> um, but to talk to us about um, scientist computer interfaces for data intensive science, please. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? All right, great. So my name is Cecilia Aragon, and I'm a staff scientist here at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is the lab just above um, the UC Berkeley campus, and I'm also a professor at the University of Washington. And just to give you a little bit about my background, so that you understand the context I'm coming from as I describe this system. Um, I, I had many years as a, a, a graphic software developer in both industry and in, in government labs working on scientific projects. I actually, my first summer job was working on scientific computing way back when I was still in high school. But now as I've moved into research, I'm interested not just in the applications of building these tools for e-science and cyber infrastructure, but also in trying to understand the theoretical concerns, the, the problems that need to be solved so that we can address these issues. So everybody here is aware that the world of science is changing. And uh, so I'm, I'm not gonna belabor these points that we have the increasing growth of data but I, I think a lot of the points that Jane made about the, the, these new social technologies and the generational shift of scientists are actually having a fairly profound effect that I think we really need to take into account on a, in, a, in a more systematic way, trying to understand what is going on with how science is being, is being accomplished today and what are the what are the fundamental issues for those of us who are interested in e-science and cyber infrastructure? What are, what are the cross-cutting themes that we need to look at? And uh, one of the key ones is, is some fairly simple ones, such as the fact that there are very lowered barriers to entry for computer-mediated communication, m much lower than there were 10 years ago or certainly 20 years ago. And, this, and what's more, any of us who, who work with kids have seen how, just how fluent young kids are with computer-mediated communication. It's almost a first language for them. Um, so we really need to think about what is the impact of this new generation coming up, you know, growing up around ubiquitous computing. How is that going to impact um, scientific knowledge, scientific, how science is done um, in, the gener in, the, in the decades ahead? So, I wanted to put up a couple of interesting slides. I'm sure everybody is aware of the fact that, um, that scientific collaboration has been growing, but this is a very interesting slide that describes the maximum number of authors on a single paper, a single scientific paper, from um, 1987 through 2006. And what's interesting is, you know, back in the late 80s, um, the maximum number of authors was really only about 200, all right? So that was the largest number of authors. But, but what we've been seeing happening recently, like in 2004, there were, there were 2,500 authors on a single paper in medicine and, and more than 2,500 on a single paper in physics. Now, of course, these two groups have very, have very different reasons for this. In, in medicine, they need to federate the data and they all, they all need to come together and bring that. And, and, and for that reason, that's the, that's the incentive that causes them to collaborate. Whereas in physics, they need to build these huge machines like the, the Large Hadron Collider, and they, and they need vast amounts of resources. So they have to have everybody involved on, on these papers for that reason. So you have two different groups that, that are, are still coming to the same, to the same uh, results. And, and then if you look at just the number of multi-author papers, all right, so if you look at the, that blue line there is the number of papers they have more than 50 authors, all right? So you can see, again, back in the 80s, there were very few of them. There was only about 50 or so. But by the time you get um, after the year 2000, you're seeing 500 papers every year that have more than 50 authors in them, and, and, and similarly with all the others. So what this means is that not only are collaboration sizes growing, but it's more likely that people, that in, any given individual will be in a large collaboration. Now, given that we have these increasing collaboration sizes, one of the things that we are really, that there's been a great deal of research in the National Science Foundation and other areas that there are tremendous barriers to scientific collaboration, and, and a surprising number of them are social and not technical. Um, the, 
what, what, is, what is happening is that is there's just not enough known about the dynamics, the human dynamics of these complex work teams. You know, we're starting to understand more about the technical backgrounds and how to build you know, tools that, that can develop cyber infrastructure and e-science um, uh, you know, collaboration tools. But do we understand the human aspects that are, that are going on in, in these collaborations and that are critical for collaboration success? You have issues around multidisciplinarity, people who aren't located in the same geographic um, um, site. You have, you know, different people speak different languages, not just, you know, French versus English, but also they have different disciplinary languages. So anytime you want to support collaborative work, you have to face, you really have to face these questions. How are you going to foster these productive collaborations? And how do you provide the social resources, not just the technical resources, that support this joint learning? And so some of these papers that have, that have been, some of these studies that have been done have shown that essentially right now it's, it's quite simple. The more universities, the more organizations are involved in a collaboration, the less chance of collaboration success is measured by any number of metrics. All right, so you have fewer coordination activities with larger collaborations. You have fewer project outcomes. So this is known, but what, what we don't know is what can we do to change this, to improve it? So, okay, so that's the theoretical framework for what I wanted to talk about. And now I wanted to take a step back and talk about, about, a, about the, the particular pro, one particular project that I worked on at Berkeley Lab where we were able, this is really a case study of a project that actually was successful where we, we started out with a number of really problematic issues concerning um, uh, collaboration success and through what, what we believe are somewhat general principles, we were able to overcome many of these. So the, the project is called the Nearby Supernova Factory, and this is an international astrophysics collaboration, and it was the largest data volume supernova search in operation at its in its time. Um, and so in 2005, we be began development of a software framework that we called Sunfall. And the developers of Sunfall were an interdisciplinary team. We had physicists, computer scientists, software engineers, and the key was that all the members of the project team were equal. We, we all worked together. And this, is, this, this ended up being, being very critical for, for the success of the project later on. And it, it's unusual, because typically the way funding sources work, funding doesn't come from a single source. You have the computer scientists funded from one side, the biologists funded from another, or else the computer scientists are seen as sort of, you know, hired guns. They should just come in, build a tool, and then leave. All right. And it's, what we, part of the reason this project was successful, we believe, is that everybody was a researcher. And, every, and, and there was a there was a, a shared goal. So this is, the, these are the people that, that were involved in, in, uh, in this project. I just want to point out there's, there, are, there, there, were, there were physicists, there were astrophysicists, there were computer people, there were postdocs, there were senior scientists. Everybody was working together on this, on this project. So the, the, the Supernova Factory is an extremely interesting project that I don't have time to really talk about the the physics behind it. I'm, I'm sorry about that. I always like to talk about the physics part because it's so cool. But essentially, they're studying these exploding stars, a, a particular type, type 1a supernovae. And by studying, they're able to understand, to learn more about the nature of the universe and the expansion rate of the universe. In other words, they found out this really surprising, this really surprising discovery that there was a belief that the expansion rate of the universe was gradually slowing down over time. And by studying these supernovae, um, the scientists were able to discover that, that the, the expansion rate of the universe is actually accelerating, which is, just, which is very odd. It's a very odd result, and we really don't know anything about it. And there, it's postulated there's some mysterious substance called dark energy, which is causing this, but we don't know anything about it. It's two-thirds of the matter energy budget of the universe, and we know nothing about it. And what we need to do is collect more data, and that's the goal of this particular project. Now the, so the project has, a, a, there, it's a very difficult data problem. Um, there's a, a large amount of data, not as large as some of the, the new um, projects that are, that are on the drawing board now, like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. But what we learned from this project, which was large for its time, we think will be useful for the development of these future 
you know, very huge um, star surveys. So we had about 30,000 wide field images um, captured every night by a telescope on Mount Palomar. And then this, that, involved, that was about 50 to 80 gigabytes of data per night that was transferred to, um, to the supercomputers at the National Energy Research Supercomputing Center here at Berkeley Lab. And then we, run, we ran parallel algorithms to do image registration and subtraction. Essentially what we did is we took these, the star field data, you, you take today's star field data, you map it to the ones of, of, you know, of several months ago, and then you, all right? Do you have a, okay. So, um, yeah, could you plug it in? <laughs> All right, thanks. I'm using somebody else's laptop, right? Um, so the, uh, so the, but the, the point is, so you have the star field data and you need to, and, and what you need, to, a supernova is a new bright spot in the sky. All right, so the idea is that if you search enough of the sky and you take today's sky and you subtract, you subtract yesterday's sky or the day before from it, you'll see all these new bright spots that appear, that appear there. Um, thank you. <laughs> I, I hope it's not going to have to reboot. It probably will. Um, so, the, so the difficulty is that this that there are very many, oh, thank you, that's perfect, thanks a lot. Yay, <laughs> technology works, yeah. <laughs> um, so the difficulty is that there are, every night there are about 600,000 of these potential bright spots that need to be, that need to be extracted um, using our software, and only 10 of those maybe are going to be actual supernova candidates. Those 10 have to be found every night, and then they have to be sent to the, they're sent to a dedicated spectrograph that was built just for the project um, that's mounted on a 2.2 meter telescope in the, of, in the University of Hawaii on the summit of Mount Kea. All right, so, so there's many steps of, of dealing with the data, dealing with the data pipeline as, as we go. So it's, when you, these are Hubble Space Telescope images. When you think of a supernova, this is, this is, I know what I think. If you think of the galaxy and then a bright spot, a star that appears that's as bright as that galaxy, and it appears just one night all of a sudden, it lasts only for about three, three weeks to a few months. So you think, oh, it's pretty easy to subtract it, right? Because it's so bright and it's clear. But in reality, the images that we have to deal with are very noisy, all right? So you have things that look like this where you can't quite match them up. There's dead pixels, the CCDs don't work very well, they saturate, airplanes and cosmic rays come through, you have reflections, you have, you have characteristics like fringing and other distortions of the data. And out of all this, you, you have to still find those bright spots in the data. All right, so it's a, this is a complex image processing problem. We spent a lot of time on the technical details to make sure that we got this right. Okay, now I'm gonna step back and talk about the people issues, which are, which are also another challenge. So this was a cross-cultural collaboration, as I said before. There are about 30 collaborators, and half of them are in the US and half are in France. And the telescope in Hawaii needs to be operated by a group of people remotely every night, all right, night Hawaii time, which is daytime in, in France. And um, there, so there are people who are, are handling this telescope remotely over different time zones, and they have to make correct decisions collaboratively. Right. Some team members have never met. There, a number of people don't have English as a native language. English is the, is the official language of the collaboration. Um, the, the telescope interface is a custom one of um, uh, piece of, uh, I won't say what it is, yeah, <laughs> that has the <laughs> legacy code that, that, has to, that, is ver that has no documentation. All right, and so this has to be handled, and it's also very critical because telescope time is very expensive and it's scarce, all right? If a supernova comes up one night, you don't want to miss it. So there's all these, these challenges that need, to be, that need to be dealt with. All right, so when, when I joined the project in 2005, what was ex this is something that I'm sure a lot of you have, you, you've seen this, this same sort of situation. There were a bunch of scripts that had been written by various graduate students over a period of 10 or 15 years, right? They had, you know, very good algorithms, but that didn't interoperate. There was a tremendous amount of manual work that needed to be done to take the data from one step to the next. And when I first joined the project, 
the pe people were spending a tremendous amount of time just dealing with kind of all the piece work that, that, that needed to be done. All right, so there was a lot of human labor going on in, in this process. And as a result, actually, no data was being, was being taken. And, it, and the, the morale in the group was, was uh, kind of low. Um, so what we, de we determined we needed to do is to build a software framework that could handle you know, soup to nuts, everything, the, the entire very heterogeneous data pipeline. All right, the supernova search, the data analysis, dealing with the spectroscopic data capture, the scientific discovery and the workflow visualization, each of these pieces was quite different from all the others and it needed to be put into an integrated unit. So we developed four major components. There was the search, the, 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 the parallel pipeline that dealt with this high, um, image, high volume image data. There was a workflow status monitor that was built specifically to handle the workflow management. Um, the, uh, the, we built a tool called the data forklift which handled scientific data management and um, and then the, the, the Supernova Warehouse was a special tool for um, data management, data provenance, visualization, and interactive data exploration. And so what we did with these tools is we combined the new tools with the, uh, with the legacy components. All right, so one of the questions that people often ask me in these talks is, well, why didn't you use X, you know, such that, where X is a, a software tool that, that is a, that's, a, that's, a, um, that's an existing, you know, um, Pipe, that's an existing uh, workflow management system. And we looked, at, we looked at all the workflow management systems that were around in 2005. And what, one of the, I remember one of the scientists said to me, this, these, these uh, workflow management tools make the easy, do all the easy things, but, they, but the hard things they don't handle. All right. And so it, it, we realized that if we were going to use one of the tools that was already out there, it wouldn't solve the problems we had, like dealing with errors, dealing with, you know, you, you have 200 jobs running and one of them fails. How do, you, how do you deal with, how do you recover from errors in a smooth way? How do you interface between, again, between, you need to have humans dealing with the data pipeline. You, you could not completely automate everything. This is one thing we realized. So what became really important was the human interface. Having enough, as much automation as possible, but, but making it easy for people to be able to connect with, with, the, with the automation. And at that time, there were no, there were no existing tools that, that, had, that had all these characteristics. So um, this is the, the, the system today. All right, so I want to emphasize, this is a production system that is still in use today in 2010. We started building it in 2005, and the scientists are still using it, even though all of the computer people have moved on to other projects, because that's the nature of the funding, the funding process. And people sometimes ask us, too, is this, is this, is this system going to be useful? Is this, you know, can it be modified for other, you know, for, for biology, for bioinformatics? And, the answer to that is no, because this system was built just for this project. What we think is useful are the lessons learned from building, from building the system. Um, so we, 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 took, so we, ha we included all the legacy code that had... Five minutes? I've only been talking for 17. Are we supposed to stop after 20? I'm sorry. Okay, I apologize. All right, then I'll have to go through fast. Um, Okay, so I'm going to skip over some of the some of the interesting technical stuff that we did, and, and just move on to um, what the what the benefits of the system was. Um, so the key lesson that I want to that I want to um, that I'd like to um, make sure is known in this with with this particular project is that it's important to look at how humans interact with the data, and it's important to take into account some of the human considerations in dealing with, in dealing with the system. So this particular system took 1.5 years to deploy, and there were five person years um, of, of, of time in, in terms of building the software. But it paid for itself an operational cost alone in one year because it turned out that once we had the system up, we calculated that it was saving 5.25 full-time equivalents per year in, in terms of operational work on this, on this project. And also, we, it enabled new science discovery because all these people, all these scientists now, instead of doing operational work, were able to put the work into papers. Um, it also reduced data taking errors and just generally increased the, the successful collection of the data. So, so as an overall guideline, we, we looked at all the tasks, both before and after, how we were able to 
to reduce the, um, the, the essentially grunt work and move people into, the, into doing pure science work. And we, and we measured the amount of data that was collected over time. So this is where we started, right here. And, um, and, then, and we also noted that, that the number of publications went from zero at this time to 10 in, in 2009. So to conclude, all right, it, when we're thinking about dealing with e-science frameworks and, and uh, cyber infrastructure, there's a tendency sometimes for those of us who are computer scientists to get to just think about the technical problems. You know, do we have enough, enough uh, you know, fiber optic bandwidth? Can we, can we build a machine learning algorithm that's, that's efficient enough? Do we have enough um, raw compute power? Do we have, you know, enough, do we have an, you know, enough cores to handle the, 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 um, the really difficult problems that we have to deal with? Um, but there are other, there, there's another concern that I'd like to make sure that, that you all think about as well. So we know that the amount of data in the world is increasing exponentially. So, okay, so, but Moore's law says that processing power is also increasing exponentially. So you might think this could keep up with it. It's actually not quite true because of Amdahl's law. Um, you know, we are going to multi-core and many-core architecture, but we don't have perfectly parallelizable computations. So, so this is kind of the speed up that, that's achievable based on the portion of the parallelizable versus the, the serial portion of an algorithm. So we're, we're running, this is the issue. That gap there is the one that people are often talking about when they talk about the crisis that's, that's going on in, in terms of large data. I mean, th so you hear a lot about this. But I'd like to say that there is one other really key gap that needs to be addressed, and that's human cognitive capacity, which is, is not increasing exponentially. <laughs> it's, it's flat, essentially. I mean, maybe, well, maybe my kids think that they're, they're better at multitasking than I am, but it's certainly not, it's, it's not even quadratic. So I think that we really, when, as we build these systems, we need to think about how can, we t how can we take human cognitive capacity, the limitations of human cognitive capacity into account, and how can we meet this gap? And to do that, we really need to think about efficient performance both on the com computational side and on the human side. And that's what we did when we built this, when we built Sunfall, is, is we spent a lot of time thinking about the human interface. As a matter of fact, the entire project was built that way from the start. We used user-centered design techniques from the very beginning. Um, so in the end, the, the development for this project led to publications in both computer science and physics. We actually ended up with three best paper awards in computer science for the, for the work we did on, you know, in machine learning and image processing and human-computer interaction. There are, uh, this is one of the wonderful things about working in e-science is there's so many really, really interesting problems to, to be solved that they just pop up everywhere you go. And in addition, we had um, impact on science by, by um, increase basically with just a third of the data that's been, that's been collected by the nearby supernova factory that's been processed. It's already, it's already doubled the existing collection of um, nearby supernova that the world has access to. So in the future, I, I would like to suggest that it's really important that we understand the social processes in scientific collaborations. So when we develop these collaborative computing technologies, we should think not just about the technologies, the databases, the visualization that's required for data-intensive science, but we should also think about the study of socio-technical systems for science. Um, and when we do this, I would like to suggest that we form interdisciplinary teams to build these generic tools for scientists. When we're doing this, and these, we should have equal participation, not just from domain scientists and computer scientists, but also from social scientists. So that, I think I managed to speed it up. Perfect, thank you very thank much. Thank you very yes. much. So I'd uh, like to invite uh, Kenji up to maybe switch computers and then give um, a chance for Cecilia to field a, a question or two. Are there any questions? Um, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, my question, you uh, partially actually answered yes. in your last slide. 
uh, but uh, maybe more specifically, uh, do you already have any generic tools uh, which can be applied in that uh, data-intensive science area as a result of your successful uh, project on Supernova? I would say, okay, so we did not, I would say we did not build any generic tools, but the, what I think, what, what we contributed to, to the field in general is more an understanding of what needs to go, of, of guidelines that need to be, that need to be implemented for these tools to be built. So we wrote a number of papers where we studied the effects, at, you know, what was successful and what was not as successful in our systems. and. So it's more, these were more theoretical guidelines. So we had sort of two, we were kind of, on one side we were very, very technical and specific, and on the other side we were, we were more abstract and theoretical. And we didn't go to that middle ground of, build, of building generic tools for, you know, for all scientists. Yes. yes. Hi, uh, nice talk, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, it's fair to say, and I hope people in the audience would agree, that there, we don't have a science of tool building. We don't have the basic abstractions that we know that we should expose and various so on and so forth. But the pointed question is the following. If, this was, if you were starting this project again in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, has the landscape of workflow tools changed, improved? Do you think you might be closer, if not exactly there, to using something? And yes, no, why would be a great answer. And if I can overload the question, uh, why do you think, in spite of so many quote-unquote successful workflow tools, mm -hmm. interoperability remains, amongst workflow tools, remains a, a, a dream? Okay, that is, that is a great question. Um, so first of all, yes, I definitely think that, w that we have improved. Um, the, if I were to, to work on a project like this now, I think there would I would look at a number of the existing workflow tools that are out there, and I think, I think there are some that might very well be useful. Um, however, I, that said, from the tools I have looked at, they still have some issues, and, and a lot of the issues have to do with barriers to entry, for example. A workflow tool should not be so complicated to use that the scientists have, have to spend a huge amount of time to get started on it. It should be extremely easy. I and mean, one, th one of the general principles we found is that if a tool takes a scientist an hour to learn, they're not going to do it, all right? Because they would rather go and do, you know, do the science. I mean, there, there are exceptions, all right? If the tool is clearly valuable and, and they can see it's going to save them time, they'll do it. But if they have some existing way of dealing with it, you know, like if, if they're, 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 they have some scripting tools that work and they just are sort of annoying, but they won't switch to your new tool if your tool is more annoying, all right? Your tool has to be less annoying. All right, and so I think this is one of the key things is that everybody who's building scientific workflow tools now really sh should think really hard about usability. I mean, I think every, pr I mean, I, this is something that I talk about to people at the lab a lot in the Department of Energy is they say, well, we don't have enough funding for usability. We want to focus on functionality. And I say functionality is no good if people aren't going to use it. I learned that, whoops, I learned that when I was writing code for NASA many years ago. And, you know, I spent all this time writing this beautiful code. It was really technically excellent. And then the scientists didn't want to use it. I thought, why? It's great. And it turned out it was, it's because it was a pain to use. And that's what got me started in, in, in usability. So I think that, that one of the key things that I, I'm starting to see now, I, saw, I see a number of people talking about usability and talking about ease of use, walk-up usability. And that's the direction that I think that we're going into. And, I, and I'm really happy to see that happening. Now, did that answer all your questions, or did I, did I miss one? Yes. Oh yes. No, we we. I I there is yes. That's a really good point. There is no in my opinion there is really almost no science of tool building. We need to develop the theoretical framework to understand what is it going to take to build tools for large collaborations, and and to do that we have to look at the human side as well as the technical side, and you have to look at how the two of them interoperate. And we need to have work in that. And it's very hard, right? Because engineers and computer scientists only work on their field. And social scientists may not have the technical training. You have to get people together. So it's, you know, it's sort of like a catch-22. You have to build a collaboration to study, the, to study how to build tools for collaborations. But I think it's going to happen because it's just needed. I mean, it's, people are getting desperate. 
you know, we have this huge amount of data and it's going to need to be solved. And so I think people are going to need to develop this science of tool building. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much. I know there were a lot of hands there, uh, uh, additional questions, but we really do need to get going because we've got a, um, another group coming in right up at 3 o'clock. So um, please, uh, everyone, join me again. And, and thank you, Cecilia, for your experience. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Kenji Takeda from, uh, from Southampton, who will be talking to us about uh, the work that um, he and many others from uh, across, across their campus have been working on with, uh, with SharePoint. Over to you. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, so yes, it's a, a large collaboration here. The first three names after mine, Richard, Stephen, and Mark, the ones who did the work. Um, I'm going to describe three particular projects, uh, and then Les, Mr. E. Prince, um, Simon Coles, Simon Cox, various other people who have also been working on it. So I'm going to be talking about SharePoint, uh, Microsoft SharePoint. Uh, 2010 in this case is what we've been looking at uh, and I'm going to go through three examples of projects that are, that, that are current projects that are ongoing um, in using SharePoint in order to support our science um, and engineering um, at Southampton. Um, my role, one of my roles is as a director with Simon Cox of the Microsoft, in Microsoft Institute for High Performance Computing at Southampton and that's our credo there which is basically um, looking at uh, how we can leverage Microsoft stack um, in order to make science and engineering faster, cheaper, and, and better. Um, I'm an engineer. I'm actually an aerospace engineer, um, but I have the privilege of working with lots of other people in other domains. So Microsoft SharePoint 2010, I went to the SharePoint conference last November in Las Vegas, which was very nice. Steve Barmer stood up and said, people often ask me what SharePoint is. I don't know. I don't have an answer. SharePoint is many things to many people. Um, it is a platform, okay? Uh, a lot of people look at it as an, uh, an end product. Um, it's actually better to look at it as a platform with lots of out-of-the-box functionality. So SharePoint is used a lot as a, as a portal. So these are some screenshots from our um, portal that we're rolling out in the next few weeks at Southampton um, in order to improve our collaboration. So that's the sort of home page. Um, 2010 is quite interesting. It basically is Facebook. So it has things like um, uh, status updates. There are walls and various other things. It's very social. That's one of the new things in 2010. Um, it has a search feature. You can find people, but you find people on expertise. It actually uses things like social distance. So it looks at how many authors, how many documents you've co-authored with people, how far apart they are in the organization from you. And it uses those things um, in order to return search results in the relevant order. So there's lots of personalization um, in SharePoint, so that's fun. Um, we're actually looking at how we can use SharePoint to enable uh, better research, um, which is largely what this talk is about. Uh, and so this is a, a project site that we've come up with, has got various features. Um, let's get the laser in the right place. Um, SharePoint operates on lists, so lists of documents, media assets, calendars, tasks, etc. So discussion forums. So this is essentially the project site template that we've been developing in order to support our research. And we can also use that to um, publish to the public internet as well. So um, this is a private view uh, login. And a lot of people use it for content management. And it also does enterprise records management as well. It does version control. It hooks into the Office stack very nicely. So. SharePoint in a nutshell. I was at the SharePoint conference for a week, and I just scratched the surface you know, by sitting there eight hours a day seeing SharePoint talks. So there is an immense amount of functionality um, within SharePoint. In terms of how SharePoint can be applied for science and engineering, um, within the Microsoft Institute, we sort of use this term high productivity computing. So HPC is normally called high performance computing. And normally, if you go to supercomputing, which is in New Orleans next month, everybody's trying to see how fast they can run one calculation on the biggest supercomputer in the world. My computer is bigger than yours, and I can run Linpack faster than you can. We've taken a different view of science and engineering as an end-to-end -end process, and it's the productivity of the scientist going from a hypothesis to an end test of that hypothesis and a conclusion which is important, and breaking that into its steps. It's not always the computation that is the slow part. Um, so workflow is very important, but not workflow in terms of just the data processing, but the entire human workflow of that process. 
data management, which I'll talk a lot about. I won't talk much about collaboration, but SharePoint is a, is a good platform for that. And also publishing, again, which is something I'm not going to talk too much about, a little bit about. Um, so this is a SharePoint project site. In terms of workflow, an example we use here is for risk assessment, so health and safety, things like COSH forms in the UK. And we're very conscious about what we do with chemicals and how we dispose of them. So one of our processes at Southampton for risk assessment, before I do anything, um, I need to fill out a form which says, what are the risks? How am I mitigating the risks? If it goes wrong, what do I do? We currently have a paper-based system. Our current web system is we have a web page which looks like this. I fill it out on the web, and then at the end, I print it, sign it, and take it to the health and safety officer. So that's the extent of our current electronic process. Um, in SharePoint, what we've done is we've looked at this as a more electronic process. Um, and here we see the actual uh, workflow itself. This You draw this in Visio, and it hooks into the Windows workflow engine, which sits behind SharePoint. And you can customize this. We've actually done a lot of work doing scientific data processing using Windows workflow. And you can wrap anything. You can call web services. Um, we can do FFT transforms of terabytes of data with Windows workflow. It's a it's, it's, it's very nice workflow engine. Um, and here. What's interesting, as a scientist, we often think that what we do is very, well, is unique and very special, and that nobody else in the world could possibly be doing what we're doing. It turns out that this workflow is a workflow that has some electronic process, it has some human process. This is basically the same as the out-of-the-box expense processing workflow that ships with SharePoint. So when you look at workflows in a business process, um, a lot of what business does is actually exactly what us as scientists do. So I'm going to talk about archaeology first. Um, Graham Earl is our resident archaeologist. There's about 30 of them. What's interesting with archaeology, and, and, and we're doing a lot of work around data management, is archaeology is all about data. It's about things that you find, and it's all about metadata. For hundreds of years, archaeologists have been taking down metadata. When they go in the field, they do a grid with string. So when they find things, they can record exactly where it was found. They also have a huge amount of data of different types. They have some small data, lots of small data, some big data, and lots of big data. That's how I classify data. Um, and, and it's great. And the other thing is that context is everything. You have data, but what you need to do is what is the context and the interrelations between all of that data. This is a project, Portus, which is a, a port found in Rome, um, uh, which was, was not known of before. This is our typical Indiana Jones picture of an archaeologist. This is a more modern um, sort of picture of archaeologists who have pretty advanced uh, tools, geophysical tools. They generate lots of data. Um, and then with that data, they look at context. And our archaeologists actually are specialists in CGI reconstruction as well. So they take all of this data, and then they hypothesize on what it would have looked like using the same sort of technology um, used in Avatar. In fact, it is the same software that was used in Avatar. So you can see there's a, a, a wide variety of data. And they're desperate for a solution. So we're looking at SharePoint 2010 as a data management solution. Here we see um, a list. It's a media asset library. Basically, it's SharePoint solution for managing pictures and video. OK? Out of the box. So I'm going to show you the out of the box functionality. So we can upload images into SharePoint. This is an upload page. Um, SharePoint's interesting. It has what are called content types. These are actually independent of file types. Um, and a content type can have its own metadata schema. So the archaeologists have said, well, actually, you know, we have particular content types. This is actually a they, 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 they work in terms of fines, so this is a general find, but they could have a, you know, a piece of pottery, or it could be a laser scan or something. Content types can have their own metadata schema. They can also have workflows associated with them. So when I upload a file of a particular, and I label it as a particular content type, it can automatically trigger a workflow to do something. For instance, process it. So this is quite nice. And again, context is important. So here what we've been doing is we've looked at um, a little tool which embeds Live lab Lab's pivot inside of SharePoint. So this is SharePoint. And basically, I can navigate to this find. And so this is what Alex um, showed uh, yesterday is pivot. And we have all the uh, metadata tags here on the left. And I can tick the tags and then pivot the Silverlight um, uh, web part basically allows us to slice and dice the data. Uh, and this is what the archaeologists love. They actually came to us and said, actually, what we want is Adobe Bridge. 
Okay, so Adobe Bridge is what ships with Photoshop and all those things, and, and photographers, again, love metadata. But this is much more dynamic. And again, as an archaeologist, what they need to do is they need to think laterally. They need to be able to make connections as they look at finds and what the context is, and they can look at a geophysical map, and they can see the edge of a wall and look at the actual piece of wall and say, oh, actually, the soil's there. And, and so archaeologists um, need tools like this it's a very actually creative, it's very scientific, and science is creative, but this is the creative part of the archaeological process. Um, and so you can see how they can slice and dice it. So when we showed them this, in fact, when they saw the demo of Pivot initially, they just said, we really need that. This is the outcome. So again, with all of that and with the context, so you saw the trenches, you saw them digging, you saw them looking like mowing the lawn, but actually taking uh, magnetic scans. Um, this is then the output, is that they can then piece all of that together and create um, a visualization of what the past looked like. And of course, this was rendered on our Windows HPC cluster. We'll be demoing this at Supercomputing uh, in a month in New Orleans. If, you, if you're there, come and stop by. Um, so that's an example in the, in the humanities. Um, another example I want to show you is our new CT center. So there's an excellent talk this morning. Um, from uh, the Australian um, synchrotron people about CT scanning. Um, a CT scanner, it's basically an X-ray, very powerful X-ray device that allows us to see uh, inside things. And we have um, essentially the most powerful device in, in the UK at the moment. The, the one up from it would be a linear accelerator. So we can do um, investigations in everything from archaeology. We can put air, aircraft turbine blades in. Um, this... Um, over on the right there is actually uh, a worm from the bottom of the ocean. This is a wing section. So a very wide range of disciplines. And it basically we're concerned with imaging, data handling, and computer vision algorithms in order for us to extract various features. This is a shared facility for anyone at the university. And this is essentially the workflow. Um, and so we've looked at what do you need to do to use the facility. You go to the website, you apply. You then consult, you look at scheduling, we then have to do some safety training. At this point, you run your experiment, and this is when you're starting to gather data, um, and then you start analyzing your data. So this is the user experience. And if you look at this, this workflow, what we're actually using is the SharePoint workflow to do what we call the business workflow, because that's the bit scientists really don't like, the bureaucracy of being able to access a large facility, okay? We want to concentrate on the science, okay, which is largely the bit in here, and there is a lot of work on that. But in terms of workflow and this productivity, we're trying to leverage these business platforms in order to make the scientist more productive. Um, with the big data, the problem is we have very big files. So a typical file might be 20 gig for one file. The single file data files could be 100 gigabytes each when we go to full resolution. It's computationally intensive. We're using GPUs. This is the architecture, so the pink box in the middle is the CT center. The bottom right yellow is our data center where we've put in a 60 terabyte fiber channel disk system. And then we have 10 gigabit, which is the little red lines that go to the purple room here, which is our analysis room. And we actually have remote workstations and using GPU. So it's a pretty involved architecture. We've spent about a quarter of a million just on the data um, itself. In order to manage the data, SharePoint is excellent at managing data. However, there are limits in terms of the size of an individual file. And so what we've done is we've decided to keep the files in the file system. And the user can put the data, their files into the file system. We have a watcher service which picks those up and a metadata sync service. So we can put the metadata into SQL Server. It actually creates a backup.experiment folder that holds an XML file with a database in case we need to move it to another server. And then SharePoint is the front end. So this is a scan of a mouse's head. Here what we do is we've got the folder. So this is just on the um, file system. We dump the folder in. The watcher service picks it up. SQL Server then starts managing it. And then within SharePoint, this is the web part with a little visualization. So this visualization is actually looking at a 20 gigabyte voxel data set. Uh, and just by clicking here, we can actually move and slice and dice. And you can see in the green box there, we're actually um, slicing through the data set. So it shows how SharePoint is very good at being a front end to that very 
sort of deep stack in terms of you know, managing 60 terabytes of data. And this is the sort of voxel data set that we get. And this is the mouse's head where we can do density um, filters. And so we can look at the fur and then look through into the, the skull of the head. So that's actually using SharePoint to manage large data. Last thing I want to talk about is oops, got water, um, federated repositories. So we have an institutional repository at Southampton based on ePrints, of course. Um, there are discipline repositories that hold data such as eCrystals and MDC, which is our new materials data center project, which we're building on SharePoint. And this project called EP to DC was looking at how do we link the publications to the data, but in a federated way where the publications sit in a publication repository and the data sits in a discipline data repository. And so the architecture we have for this is shown here where we basically upload into ePrints and ePrints talks across into our SharePoint MDC store here and there's some negotiation and the data gets pushed backwards and forwards um, so that you end up with essentially the publication sits in ePrints, so this is our university ePrints. What I would do with a new ePrint is this is the workflow at the top which is ePrints workflow, not, not SharePoint workflow. And we've uploaded our paper and now we go to a data uh, screen so we can upload our data um, here it's actually in XML format, uh, and we tag the data. That then gets shipped across into SharePoint. What's interesting is that we're using MatDB, which is a standard format uh, schema, and share we get a lot of things for free in SharePoint. One of the things we get is XML schema validation, so it actually, for free, will validate the data to make sure that it, it matches our schema. Another thing SharePoint has a tax is a taxonomy engine, so it has a, a list of keywords. So when I'm typing in the metadata, it can auto-complete based on my set taxonomy. So it's fired the data across into SharePoint. And then this is the ePrints page, which shows the at the top the PDF research output paper, but then it also pulls back from SharePoint um, the data files associated with that publication. So again, we believe that there's federated model of having where you're going to have some of your publications here and some of your data scattered around. It allows us to link those up. So just in conclusion, hopefully that's given you a little bit of flavor of what SharePoint 22 can do, 2010 can do. Um, and again, it, it's a very deep stack, a wide stack. It does a lot. But in terms of what we've been looking at, um, is actually largely data management. It's something we really care about. And this morning, Philip Bourne was talking about, you know, we need to have some platform for scientists um, to do their daily business. The project site in SharePoint is what we're looking at doing, and that project site will be the center of our research as well. They'll put their data in there, they'll collaborate, um, version control, and then we can also flick a switch and make that data publish, public as well. So we're using SharePoint essentially as our platform for research and leveraging a lot of the out of the box and things like the web part for big data we've written ourselves, um, but it demonstrates how extensible um, SharePoint is and the ability to integrate with repositories. And I haven't really touched about the features, but the scientific blogging um, that, that uh, Jeremy Frey and others were looking at are things that we're looking to roll into SharePoint as well, just as a delta. So SharePoint is basically looking at providing about 80% of the functionality we need as scientists and researchers, and we just have to put this little 20% layer on top, writing workflow activities, uh, appending the blog, etc. So hopefully you found that interested, interesting and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kenji. Any questions? Thanks a lot. N nice overview on the, um, the overall uh, platform. Um, question for you. When you look at the large amounts of data that we're all starting to collect, and you have this kind of layer between the presentation, the architecture, and say the file system architecture, a lot of us are trying to figure out where does that data actually physically reside? Um, you know, down in the file <coughs> system or move it up at a higher level using the platform overview that you went through. Um, at the file system level, how are you dealing with the sort of 60 terabyte range at the file system level? Um, uh, I guess just, the question is, what file system are you using to? Uh, we just have a NetApp box on there to do the, the back end file system, actually. So, so then that is, so then it's it's the a, upper level protocol is exposed out as sort of a SIFS or Samba? Uh, I think it's done as a Samba, yeah, or something, yeah. So I'm not sure that the IT guys were. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. We've basically done it as a service, and we've said to our IT department, Go build this. Go build it. And then we're building the SharePoint on top of that. But I do know it's a NetApp box. 
that we can just talk to directly, and I think it's using something like Samba, yeah. So you're using a lot of mount points? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. okay, so, thanks So a lot. we haven't optimized it, but we're, you know, that, that project actually, we just that architecture diagram I showed you is, is two or three weeks old, so we, yeah. <laughs> we've I guess had to go through that over quite a period of time, and, and as this, so it's a five-year um, program, basically, and we're about six months in, so, yeah. um, so, so there's a few things um, that, that, you know, we may hit a few barriers and things, but again, having the sort of segregated sort of stack mm -hmm. means that we can take things out and put them in and refactor fairly easily. So I think that's, that was one of the reasons actually for going for that separation in that stack. Um, yeah. SharePoint, for the archaeology stuff where the data's not as big, we just put it all into SharePoint, let it manage it, basically. Where files are smaller than two gigs, it's not too much of an issue. And we spent quite a few, probably two or three months looking at this big data, you know, how we were going to handle that. So that's our current sort of solution. So. Other questions? I have, a, I have a quick one, which mm. is, what has been uh, the, the user response, the end users? Ah. <laughs> and, and please be frank. <laughs> um, it's kind of interesting. We had a, you know, something on usability. And um, what's interesting is, is we, were in the, we were out in the foyer yesterday, and I was going through the talks, and the postgrads, and there's a woman sitting there. Um, and, and she said, oh, SharePoint, yeah, we have that. We run a logistics company. And we use it for collaborating um, with external clients and things. And what's interesting, I think, is that SharePoint, because it has a wide user base, I believe that Microsoft actually does usability testing and knows something about human-computer interaction. So we're able to leverage that. So when we showed this to various people, um, they basically said, great, when can I have it? I want it tomorrow. And we're currently capacity planning for the university in terms of, okay, well, if we want to roll it out to 40,000 users, actually, we need to think about the enterprise architecture. But when they actually looked at the interface and how easy it is to move in, and you saw with Pivot and Slice and Dice, they just love it. I mean, it's, 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 it's miles ahead of what we've already got. So, um, and again, I think that's where we're leveraging. The other thing is when you're editing a wiki page or a blog page, you've got the Office ribbon. So again, it's a very familiar user interface. It's not some different, you know, hand-coded sort of rich HTML type interface. It's actually just like the Office ribbon. So it's a very familiar environment for users. So when they've seen it and we've shown it to people and people are using it, they, they really like it because they just feel comfortable with the UI. So, and it's very customizable as well. So go to ferrari.com if you want to see a SharePoint site because that's all on SharePoint. So you can actually make it look how you like. But this is basically out of the box. So. Well, thank you very much, Kenji. I uh, wanted to uh, thank Kenji, Jane, Cecilia, and every, um, all the three of the speakers. I think it was a very good session, and uh, we'll wrap it up. But thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.